How many here are blessed and very happy to have pastor and first lady over this church? Would you give them a hand? I really believe in getting an honor to our first lady and our pastor here because they have the vision and the hearts of each and every one of you that are here today. I've seen him talk to him many a times, and he is constantly talking about God. I prayed this morning. I was reading the word. I was doing this. I was doing that. And whenever you see somebody who is taking that time with God, that's somebody who I can get underneath and follow. You know, Pastor does a lot of things. He's always trying to be innovative. He's trying to figure out ways so that you can get the most out of New Covenant so that you can learn, grow, and serve, which is our motto. He wants you to get to a point to where you can help others. And this is the biggest thing with financial peace. Uh, Take just a second on this. This is not something that me and Rachel get anything out of. Not a single dollar, nothing. The course, what it costs, Any of the books we sell, we don't get nothing out of it. And it's not because we want to get something out of y'all, but I found something that has helped me tremendously and get to where I'm at today, and I'm still working towards, but why would I know something or have something and not share it with the body of Christ? If it worked for me, it's very, 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 very well possible that it'll work for you, and it's even proven with over 5 million people taking the course. And so I was talking to Pastor, said, you know, If we had everybody in our church that was getting out of debt, getting debt free, everybody was being able to be smart with their money and living on a budget and all those other aspects, what could they start to do for the kingdom of God? If the whole church of the United States started doing that and we started pouring money into the politics and into our law system and all these other places and they started being able to go in for us and start saying, you know what, no, we don't want that. The people of of the United States of America, we want things of God in this country. And so because of that, I said, I want to do my part, and I want to help y'all. So if y'all have any issues or you're in any kind of aspect of financial place, take a look at this stuff. It it helped me tremendously. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have and try to help you in any way I can. (laughs) You can ask Rachel. She tells me, are you listening to Dave Ramsey again? She, she gets tired of it. I'm like, listen, if I'm going to be leading people and trying to help facilitate and teach these people what he's teaching, I got to know it like the back of my hand and be able to spit it out there to you. Because y'all are going to spend money. You're doing things. I want to be as much, as much of a help as I can for you. And so through all of this and through all this thinking, one thing that's been laying very heavily on my mind and the, the phrase come to mind, I, I had a few different titles that I wanted to go, but it was mistaken identity or identity theft. And I said, nah, eh, that's okay. So I, t- I changed the, to the title of my message to Identity Crisis. And the reason why I feel like this is from a lot of stuff that I'm seeing on the Internet and on TV and through social media and stuff is where our country is as a nation. Has, has anybody here ever seen Tarzan on Disney? Y- y'all, y- you know how I'm talking about? Who is Tarzan? He's a man living among apes. And so he's going around, he's try- and he starts saying, you know, I'm not like these other people. I'm not like these other apes. What, what's, what's going on? This is not working. I can't keep up. I can't do what the apes do. Well, guess what he's doing? He's trying to search for his place. He's trying to search for who he is. And he's trying to live a life that he is not. And so today in America, as I'm sitting here, I see a very divided people and as a nation. And I think a lot of that has started where where the church is at. Our church has lost our identity. We have lost who we are. I've often said that a long time ago, 80% of Americans went to church. 80% 80% of Americans knew the word. They knew what God said. This place was founded on biblical principles of the word of God. It's all over our monuments. It's all over our capital. It's all over our government. It's even on their money. You pull it out, it says, in God we trust. That's what it was founded on. And this country was, was founded on the beliefs of having the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. And as we go through and we're looking at all this stuff, I don't care what race you are or who you are or anything like that, But the matter of the fact is we were founded upon biblical principles of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
if you look at the forefathers, the people who signed the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, all that, all that there's so much Christianity wrapped up into it, it's not even funny. But we have a lot of people today because we're trying, we don't know who we are, and we're trying to assimilate to every single aspect of every person in the world, and we've got open borders and all this other stuff. Now we don't have an identity. We're a melting pot. So who are we? How, how can we have a direction as a nation? How, how can we know what we want to do and where we want to go? How do we know what to plan or, or I mean, how, how do you make any decisions? How do you rule when you have no, no boundaries, no, no guidelines? When all that's taken away, you, you have a, a society that lives the way they want to live, do what they want to do. And, 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 and there's lawlessness in the land. The people have a reprobate mind. You know what I'm saying? And so that's where I feel like we as a nation are at. And I want to challenge you today. I don't want this to be a down mess. I don't want this to be a thing where you feel guilt-ridden or guilt-tripped into this. I want it to be a soul-searching aspect in your heart, saying, am I doing everything that I can? Am I being the man, the woman, the child of God that I need to be for the church so that we can reach out to the community, change the community, and then change the city, then change the state, and then change the nation as a corporate body of believers. Yeah. And I still believe there's a very powerful remnant here in the United States. Yeah. I, I still believe that. I don't believe that remnant is diminished. I don't think it's without power. But I do believe we're sitting back and, we're, and we don't know who we are and we're not operating in the gifts and the spirit and the talents that God has given us to reach forth. If so... Why is all evil being present? Why are we having rules and le legislation and the, and the things of this government coming forth if it was not so? We would have people in place. We would be going forth. The power of God would overtake anything that would be trying to come into the, to the, to the United States. And so as I'm sitting here, I really feel like as a result of this, our religion freedoms are being threatened. And the church is also going to be threatened later on which is also another sign of the end of times. We also know in the book of Revelation, it talks about, you know, as, as we get into the end days, evil would be very present. He even said, when he comes back, will I find any? Will I find any? Will there be any saved? If we ain't careful, we'll become a New Testament Solomon and Gomorrah. And he'll say, well, I can I find 10? And I don't want that to happen. I don't want to be a part of that. I want to save the city. I want to save the community. I want to save our states. I want to save the United States because we know we got something that works. We know we're a part of something that can make a difference in somebody's life. We know somebody who can deliver, heal, set free, bring peace in people's lives that can change your life into a 180 so that you can go the direction that will make you the most happiest and most fulfilled in your life. That's what the whole Bible is. The Bible is nothing but guidelines and, and boundaries so that you know what you need to do so you can do, accomplish, succeed, be happy, and be able to live this life to the most fulfilled life you can live. Not man. Man doesn't know it. Man thinks it knows, but man's heart is evil. And so as I'm sitting here, I really feel like there's a great shift, sifting that is going on in our church. I believe as we continue to go on, if the church does not stand up, we do not operate in the power, I believe it will get to where the wheat and tares are going to start separating. Mm -hmm. And we're going to really begin to see who people really are, and you've got to decide which side you're going to be on. on. That's right. Choose you today who you're going to serve. Yeah. Will you serve God, or will you serve yourself? Because no man can have two masters. So we have to draw a line, and this is one thing I love about Pastor. Is Pastor is very, very, very much trying to be innovative and up-to-date and all this other stuff, and I have no problem with that. And I think we do a very good job here of trying to be appeasing, but also being truthful. Yeah. It's a fine line. It's not a hard line to walk, I know, because they want to do everything they can to help build the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. We want to be attractive but also be truthful so that we do not water down the word of God. There, there, there's a difference between who all wants to go outside right now and we can sit in, out there in the hot sun and sweat, or we can come in here to the air conditioner and we can sit down on the pew. I mean, we can do that. The power of God can move just as good out there as it can in here. But 
the power of God can move in here too. So why not do it in a nice, cool place? But we've got to remember the one who supplied it, and that was God. God gave us the wisdom. God gave us the money. God gave us the capability to put it together and make it work. So as I'm sitting here, I want to take us to the, the individual level through this sermon, and I want to challenge each and every one of you to question yourself of who are you? Are you trying to follow what culture tells you who you need to be? I mean, I'm not, not, if anybody in here is gay, or homosexual, lesbian, we love you. I promise I do. But whenever you look at the, the blood, you got an XY chromosome and an XX. Right. That is it. That is science. That is proven. That's scientific. I got a bachelor's degree in nursing. Trust me, this is what we were taught. <laughs> there is two identity genders, male and female. Right. If you choose to be different, that is on you. You, you've got a choice if you want to believe a lie. I can't change that. I can't make that. And that's the thing that today we have a culture trying to tell people, you can be this, you can be that. And it won't be long to say, oh, it's okay to steal. It's okay to kill. I mean, where does it stop? Where, where does it stop? Where do we stop listening to what people feel like is right or people think that is right because they feel like they're entitled to whatever belief because you can just keep on pushing the line to where there is no line, there is no boundary, there is no law, there is no rule. There is, I mean, police have no responsibility at that point. Right. There won't even be a need for them. Everything's acceptable. Everything is, 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 is agreeable. Everything's willing to be done and no consequences. So the first, le- the first uh, verse I want to go to is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 3. Now, I understand this lesson in the Bible is more so talking about the issue of sex in that, in, in that aspect, in that context of this scripture. But I think you can take this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 3, as well in the aspect of what I'm talking about. If they have that pulled up, y'all have that scripture? Should be on the slides. Yep. So since then, we have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Sealed at the right hand of God. Set your mind. That's Colossians. Sorry. I said 1 Corinthians 3, 1, 1 through 3. I know both of them had almost the same thing. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 6. Yep, I'm sorry. That's my, that's my bad. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Somebody say, I'm not my own. Well, then whose are you? Really? Is your body really the temple of God? Does your body know that it's the temple of God? Or or, or is your body living the life that it wants to live? Because usually whenever you're a part of something, you have to be something, or you have to be assimilated into that aspect. So you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor your God with your bodies. As, we, as you start this process, you must first realize that if you don't know who you are, you're not going to be able to know what you can do in this world, right. what you can be, what you can accomplish, who you can help, and what kind of impact you can have on somebody else's life. So one of the first people I want to talk about was Abraham. Abraham knew who he was. Whenever you read about Abraham, you realize he was very much blessed and he was very much thought of as a friend of God. That's pretty amazing to be thought from God. I'm, we're friends. We're buddies. We hang out together. I know his secrets. He knows my secrets. We know everything about one another. There, there's nothing hid from either one of us. And so when I'm looking at this, uh, my buddy William Wright, who's actually here, didn't know he's going to be here today. We were sitting here talking about one thing of, a couple of years ago. We talked about Abraham whenever he was standing in the doorpost and the three angels were outside and he went out to them and he says, have you come to bless me? That's pretty amazing just to walk up to somebody and say, have you come to bless me? 
We would look at, at that today as you're cocky, you're arrogant. Who, who do you think you are? But Abraham knew who he was. He come out, he said, have you come to bless me? How can someone say that? How? Because he knew who he was. And he knew the life that he was living. He knew that he was in right standing with God and that he could go before the throne boldly and ask anything. With a humble heart, obviously, but he knew he could go with assurance that he could go before God and ask anything. And so he knew because of the life he lived, he could go to him and say, have you come to bless me? If so, I'm going to go kill the fatted calf. I'm going to go sit down and have a feast, and I'm going to worship you and get my blessing. This is an aspect that we don't view today very much because that's the very first thing. If you, if you read, if you continue reading about Abraham in Genesis, you'll start seeing. As soon as he asked that, first thing he went to was servanthood. Yes. He was a servant. Yes. He, he Immediately. Go get this, go get that, we're going to have a feast. That, he was going to feed the men of God or the angels. And so that's one. He was the first person that came to my mind. He knew who he was. He knew how he had connected himself and positioned himself in a place to be blessed. Yes. The next person I wanted to talk about is also the Apostle Paul. I think the Apostle Paul is very important in this aspect of knowing who you are. Because he relates to a lot of where we have been. If you look at the apostle, I don't think anybody here has done what he has done. He was killing Christians and people who believed in Jesus Christ. He had an army. He had men who would go out and search. He was a very powerful man, had a lot of money, very influential. He had resources is what we would call them today. He could go out. And it'd be just like the government, the CIA. That If you think of somebody, that's who he would probably be today. He would be in the CIA or somewhere in a very high government level, working for the government, going out here looking for each one of us to kill us. And you think, how in the world can a man like the Paul, the apostle, know who he is even if he got saved? Would that not mess with his mind? Would he not have to work through all the mental aspects that he, that he was thinking about? I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. I've also done this. Well, none of these people have. But the thing is, whenever you hear a word from God and God begins to speak to you, he'll tell you who you are. Right. He, uh, he, uh, he, if any man asks of wisdom, let him ask. That, is that not wisdom? To know who you are, because when you know, if you know you're a policeman, if you know you're an athlete, if you you know your talents, your capabilities, you know, hey, if I'm a sportsman, I'm I'm, if I can play for NFL, if I can play for NBA, then I'm worth multi millions. If you're a doctor, you know, hey, I've got the knowledge and the ability and skill sets that I can go over here and I can perform this procedure. So now you have purpose in life. So whenever you begin to get that download from God and you know who you are, then you can then start acting on that. So here the Paul Apostle was a servant. He was devoted. The Bible says he knew the law greater than any. And there's a lot more going to Paul on that aspect. But I wanted to bring out the main aspect of where he was. He got saved. He met God on the Damascus Road. And then... He lived the life of Christ. So if there's someone here who you're not saved, you don't believe in Christ, or you haven't come to that realization, it's not too late. It's never too late. You can always get down on one knee and humble yourself in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's what Paul did. Paul turned his life, made a 180-degree turnaround, and learned who he was supposed to be. Because the same intensity that he used in killing he used to live for Christ. And that's what made him a powerful and great and mighty impact man for God. He's seen who he was before he even seen it. And so there was another aspect that I remember preaching about that I wanted to bring up. And this is for each and every person in here, including myself. Is we just have wonderful worship here at New Covenant. But a lot of times we walk into a worship service and we don't really understand the worship and the power 
thereof. In Matthew 18 and 11, they don't have this, so if you want to write this down, the Bible says that he came to seek and to save that. Notice the word that was lost. He came to seek and save that which was lost. How many know that that, the word that, is not a them? And a them is not a that. He came, he came, to, save, he came to save and to seek that which was lost. What did he lose? If we go back, all the way back to the beginning of time, we also know that Satan, Lucifer, which we believe was a cherubim angel, angel, he was cast down out of heaven. So who was Satan? He was the worshiper. He was the, well, we believe the worship leader. So he came to save and to seek that which was lost. He came to save all of us, and he was seeking for something, worship, praise, that was lost out of heaven. So what did he do? A lot of people believe that God and Satan had a little conversation. <laughs> and Satan said, well, who's going to worship you now? I'm your number one man. I'm your first mate. I'm your number two. And God said, oh, yeah? You think so? Well, watch this. And he reached down and took a thing of dirt and said, let me make man. And he <laughs> breathed in the man the breath of life. And he said, I've made him in my image, and he'll worship me. Yeah. Don't you think that made Satan a little bit mad? Because here God has now cast him out and replaced him with us and made us the worship leaders for the kingdom of heaven so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth. And we, 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 whenever we begin to worship him, all Satan sees is the image of God. All he sees is, that used to be my job. I used to do that. I used to be that ranking. I used to be that high. And so you're, the, the worship that you bring forth is very powerful. There's a reason why you have a wind pipe. A wind pipe to produce a sound, to produce a musical instrument. That's what it is. It's a wind pipe. That's the reason why we have instruments. And see, whenever you begin to realize how powerful and what it does in the supernatural, when you begin to worship Jesus Christ, what it does in the supernatural it would blow your mind if, you, if your eyes were really open to that. And that's one thing that we've got to remember. If we know who we are and we realize the power that is there within inside of us, because greater that is he is within us than he that is in the world, we can operate in the power that we've never seen before. I don't think God has poured out his full power and ability upon the earth even yet. I believe we've seen glimpses of it. I believe we have seen different instances throughout the scriptures and even even up to now but there's a lot of stuff that we haven't seen about the things of God yeah. and so that's one aspect I want you to also remember is your power that's within you and so as we've kind of seen a couple of guys who have went from one place to another with, with Paul we've also seen Abraham so you think how can I know who who I am what what how do I start this well, first it comes by getting saved, obviously. Whenever you become saved and you give your life to Christ and you begin to read the Word and you begin to study, you will begin to grow closer to Him so that you can hear His voice. And we know that because my sheep know my voice. They know the shepherd. When the shepherd is calling, whenever we're at the farm and the goats, we call the goats or we call the cows, I've seen my papa, he'd go out there and, here, cows. And he'd just start calling them. And they'd come running. I'd go out there and I'd try to do it. Not a single one of them would come. <laughs> Why? Because they knew my papa's voice. They knew, hey, that man's got some food. We're about to go eat. Or at least that's what they thought sometimes. Sometimes they got took to the cell barn. But So... Whenever we realize that the cattle, the, the sheep, they know the voice of the shepherd, they know the voice of who provides for them, yeah. then we can begin to know who we are and listen to what he has to say to us. Yeah. 
And so as we get closer to God and we start learning that, and we're, that we're made in his image, that he's the author of our story, but yet we're not letting him write the story, he can no longer do nothing for us because we have free moral will. We're free agents. He, he don't want to force himself on us. That's not a loving God. That's the God that says, I love you enough. I'm going to do everything I can to impress upon you to get saved, but this has to be your choice. Yeah. Is it really love that we love God or that God loves us if he forced us to serve him? Is it, does it feel very loving whenever you have to force your kids to behave? Nope, not at all. But how does it make you feel whenever they obey and they listen and, and they're doing what you want them to do? And you say, well, man, that's my son, that's my daughter. They're doing what I need them to do, and they're listening and obeying out of their own obedience. That's love. That makes you feel a greater, intense love for them than what it would if you had to tell them to do everything. Mm -hmm.